how it goes. It makes no difference who we are, what language we may speak. What matters are the things we do and how we treat our neighbors to the choices that we make. It makes no difference whom we love God made us. Let's try it one more time. One and two. It makes no difference who we are, what language we may speak. What matters are the things we do and how we treat our neighbors to the choices that we make. It makes no did well. <laughs> Welcome to Fellowship Congregational United, United Church of Christ. We are an open and affirming faith community that is growing in spirit and working for justice. If this is your first time here or you've been here for years, or if you're joining us, joining us online, welcome to church. <clears throat> this Sunday in the United Church of Christ is Open and Affirming Sunday. Open and Affirming means a church that has done some work, including welcoming the LGBTQ plus community in the church completely, welcoming the, them publicly, and by creating an open and affirming covenant like we have on our website. It is more than just saying that you welcome all people, but it's part of a larger effort of education, advocacy, and change in the church. You can hear this work in our liturgy, liturgy and music. You can see it in our decorations, and we hope you can experience it in our welcoming congregation. This is very much part of who we are. As another symbol of that dedication, we are proud to announce this beautiful artwork that has been donated to us by the artist herself, Carrie Reynolds. Uh, the artist is with us today, if you will hold up your hand. Uh, yeah, there's, thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you very much for this. And now the, now the work goes to finding out where we're going to place this, right? Okay, there'll be a committee, for sure. This progress pride flag created as a, as a way of including more people in the original pride flag will be another reminder to us as a church that inclusion is something we're always working on. There's always more room to be made at the table. Let's start our worship together by passing the peace like this. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. 
I'm going to pass the peace along to one another. to the call of worship. God created us all and called each of us very good. together to protect the earth, the plants, wildlife, and all of God's diverse creation. the care of many doctors and had spent everything she had without getting any better. In fact, she had gotten worse because she had heard about Jesus. She came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothes. 
She was thinking, if I can just touch his clothes, then I'll be healed. Her bleeding stopped immediately, and she sensed in her body that her illness had been healed. At that very moment, Jesus recognized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, Don't you see the crowd pressing against you? Yet you ask, Who touched me? But Jesus looked around carefully to see who had done it. The woman, full of fear and trembling, came forward, knowing what had happened to her. She fell down in front of Jesus and told him the whole truth. He responded, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace, healed from your disease. These are words from our tradition. Grant, God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Thanks be to you, O God. So if you didn't know it already, uh, this is uh, Youth Sunday uh, here at Fellowship, also Pride Sunday. Um, We decided to just go ahead and do them at the same time, and this is the time when we kind of turn over uh, almost all of the service to our youth who are doing an excellent job. So there's been... um, a lot said about the Bible over the past few days. Uh, It's been claimed as the foundation of Western civilization. Uh, It isn't. It's said to be the basis for our constitution and system of law. It isn't that either, and any cursory reading of it would make that statement sound horrifying. It's been reiterated as the thing that would turn around ailing schools, though not a single shred of data exists to support such a ludicrous claim. And perhaps most troubling, on this particular celebratory day, it has been misused to injure and wound and ostracize entire groups of the diverse humanity that God made and called very good, all of it very good, in its opening passages. So here's what I'll say about the Bible, at least one thing. The Bible, friends, is like a mirror. If you want to be a self-righteous jerk, uh, you can find scriptures that will nurture that in you. If you want to be judgmental and mean-spirited, if you want to find the other wherever they exist around you, creating them out of thin air if you have to, and destroy them, If you want to cast out those who don't meet whatever standard is currently called God-ordained, you can support that in line and verse. And if you want to welcome the stranger, care for the weak and the marginalized, heal the sick, break down barriers, and embrace more of that diverse creation that God called very good, then you can find that story in this collection too. The Bible reflects our souls. It doesn't make them. That's because the Bible was never meant to be the central part of following Jesus. I'm going to say that line again. The Bible was never meant to be the central part of following Jesus. We were told to practice what he practiced to do what he did, to live our lives with wasteful love and generous grace and a deep confidence in God. And if we did that, he taught, then I promise we would all read the Bible differently. If we practice that as fully as Jesus did, we wouldn't need to memorize Bible verses. We all know people who've memorized hundreds of verses and still have lots of hate in their hearts. It isn't the Bible, friends. It's only supposed to help us connect to the holy 
And it doesn't do it nearly as well as trying to love your neighbor, which is why Jesus never held a Bible study. He never told us to memorize verses. He never set us down and said, well, what's your biblical support for that? He said, let us go where the people are. Let us go there to the other side. Let us reach out, extend our hearts, have them broken open so that we might love more fully because that's where we'll find God. That's why it's also very important to say loudly and publicly on more than just Pride Sunday that we are an open and affirming church, not despite the gospel, but because of it. Pride is so much more than parades and rainbows. We didn't even have our, we should have had our parade yesterday, right? Anybody sorry that they were not out at six (laughs) o'clock last night marching down the asphalt, right? Uh, October, let's hope, will be a wonderful time to move that. It is, pride is about having or making community. It's about learning to feel at home as you and discovering that you in the first place. It's about health and wholeness and, frankly, Right now in Oklahoma, pride is about making sure that LGBTQ plus kids know that there are places of safety and support and that they can be the person God has created them to be. Pride is about hope. If you are a 2S LGBTQIA plus person or you are just a 2S LGBTQIA plus adjacent... This is an important Sunday to say again that the Bible does not condemn you any more than it condemns any one of us. It has likely been wielded against you as a weapon by people who really don't want a deep connection with a God of love, but instead want control and power over their world. So why do we turn again this morning to this very same book? It's a good question. And my answer is because the extremists do not own it. And I want to help us all reshape our relationship to it, to learn to see God's grace and love in its pages, and to let that mirror make us better human beings. Throughout June, we've been learning these little lessons from Mark's gospel. We've learned that maybe you do have to um, lose your mind a little uh, to follow the way of Jesus. Lose our minds and find our souls. Reprogramming ourselves when we seek the change that justice requires in our world for racism and sexism and a heteronormative lens are baked into our society. They're everywhere. We've learned that we shouldn't discount the small stuff. You know, the the mustard seed size stuff. In fact, we should practice doing small well For how we do the small things is also how we do the big things. And if we can't learn to love fully and beneficially and honestly here in this church family, how can we expect to do it out there? And finally, we saw how faith isn't so much what we believe, it's what we do. Because anyone can say they believe anything, right? We see that all the time. It's why so many of us don't want to use the title Christian anymore because we see others who claim that title boldly and publicly and do some very unchristian things. So we learned. It says, it says you were a believer, yes, but you skipped the not being a jerk about it part. <laughs> So we learned, don't tell people what you believe, show them. And as an inverse, when people show you what they believe, believe them. Mark has one more lesson for us this Sunday in Pride Month, and it comes as Jesus is once again surrounded by crowds of people. But first, there needs to be a bit of a disclaimer. This is a healing story, a miraculous healing story, 
And I think healing stories need to be treated with care and respect. This one shows us a woman who gets healed, but, as the disciples point out, there are many people touching Jesus at the exact same time. So, one might ask, where is their healing? This particular Pride Month has been hard on the LGBTQ plus community in Tulsa with a good deal of loss and pain. And I don't think that these healing stories are meant to be anesthesia to all pain and suffering. They're meant to remind us that within that very real pain, there's trust and hope. And yes, even a kind of healing that may not be the exact healing for which we are praying, and likely not on our timeline. See you later, Olivia. That may have been the strategy all along, Mom. (laughs) So let us take this unnamed woman in the story today, this woman of incredible faith. She has been hemorrhaging for 12 years, and that is, according to the laws of the time, uh, ritually unclean. Now, she's a long way from the temple where ritual impurity would have kept her barred from entry. So maybe that's not the issue. Is, in fact, the issue that the people around her treat her as unclean, rejecting and vilifying her. The text says that she's spent all that she has on getting better and is now bankrupt from her illness. Sound familiar? And everything just seems to be getting worse. She trusts that if she can only touch Jesus, she will be healed. Well, actually the word in Greek that is used here is sozo. It actually doesn't mean healed. It means she trusts that she'll be saved. It's the same word for salvation. So we might ask, what kind of healing is she really seeking? Now, there's some, something physical here for her bleeding stops, the story says, but there's so much more. Jesus tells her after she confesses to the contact that her trust has saved her. And another way to translate that is to say her pistis, the Greek word most often translated as faith or belief, but which really means something closer to fidelity or confidence, that has made her whole. Her confidence has made her whole. And pistis, in Greek we should note, is almost always, as it is here, an active verb. So it is her active confidence, the trust lived out in her life and effort that makes her whole. And I wonder about this kind of healing on this particular day, this Pride Sunday. I have encountered several stories over just the past week of people contending with their child or their grandchild who's come out to them. And these particular situation involves pronoun changes and new names. And the struggle from those involved was a struggle of understanding. They couldn't figure out how to fix the problem, how to take this affliction away from their child or grandchild. And they couldn't figure out how to reconcile this with their limited reading of the Bible that they had been taught. But I caught them at the tail end of that story once they had accepted that the act of seeing that person the way they wanted to be seen didn't require their understanding at all. And there wasn't anything to be fixed and that it could be just as faithful for them to love them unconditionally as it is to follow some context out of context line of scripture once they realized these things the entire struggle changed in fact it didn't become a struggle anymore at all it really became a process of education okay well now how do I relearn how do I reprogram myself how do I start worrying about the small stuff like how I refer to them so that I can work on the big stuff how I love them fully and wholly. 
This unnamed woman spent 12 years of her life in the place of being named by others, ostracized because of the labels they put upon her. And I don't know what happens to her after this event, but I do wonder how she thinks of herself. Does she redefine her own self-image? And does that come with something like a name change, which is very common in the Bible? We don't even have her name in the first place. Or some other kind of marker of accepting who she is as Jesus did. And perhaps the most relevant question, does the community accept her back in? And how does she feel about that embrace after all of the rejection? We always think in these healing stories that we're the person being healed and we look to translate them through that lens. But my friends, what if we're meant to be Jesus? What if we're being asked to consider how we offer healing, even how we offer wholeness? Maybe I can't perform miracles, heal someone's wounds, but I can offer acceptance, empathy, Even the very important work of welcoming someone who struggle, I don't have to understand into the circle. Now, I'm going to guess that we have a wide variety of opinions here this morning on the whole miracle thing. There are some of you who have a hard time with supernatural fabrication and see these as figurative stories at best. And there are some of you who think that miracles do indeed happen, just like this, even today. And there are some who aren't sure at all what to think. You know what you've been taught, and you, maybe you'd like to believe in miracles, especially when you need one. But who knows? Well, I'm here to tell you from the pulpit, I don't know. And I've had a ridiculous amount of theological education. I don't know what actually happened in this case, or if this event actually happened at all. But here's what I do know on this Pride Sunday. If we pin all healing on the shoulders of a Jesus who will descend on any situation like Superman to save the day, we will all likely face some disappointment. If we believe that healing only comes with complete restoration to a previous state of health, or wholeness only comes when a person fits all of the norms that we place out there, often gendered and ableist and sexist norms, then healing starts to look a lot like conversion therapy, which is about as far from Jesus as you can get. But I don't think that's what we're supposed to learn from this story. I think we're supposed to learn how we can share God's love and inclusion too. As an act of healing, even an act of salvation, helping people be themselves, be whole, just as God created them. I think that we're supposed to learn how we can practice our faith like an active verb instead of adhering to it like some ancient rule book, not even written for us. I think that we're meant to lean into that kind of faith fellowship, regardless of what happens over the next few months, from legislation, from a changing climate, from elections and wars and whatever else might pop up. We are meant to center ourselves in love and compassion and community as an antidote to hate and fear. I think that it is the trust that we are supposed to learn, the confidence that if we love and welcome like Jesus did, if we even try to do that, if we choose to love God with our entirety and to love our neighbor as ourselves, as hard as that can be, it will be miraculous. May it be so. Happy Pride. Amen.
Like we did last time we had Youth Sunday, we would like to share with you all the way in which we pray together on Sunday mornings in the youth room. First, we start our singing bowl, which we rent three times. While you listen to the boat, you can take a moment to prepare your mind and your body for prayer. May you want, maybe you want to close your eyes. Maybe you want to take some deep breaths. Maybe you want to relax your shoulders. Do whatever you need to do to join us in prayer. After the bow sings, I will ask for you to share your prayers with us out loud. You can say a name, a place, a group, or anyone or anything else that is on your mind that you want our prayers for. After each name is shared, we encourage everyone to say, God, hear our prayers. Finally, we will end together to, by sharing in the Lord's Prayer. Now, as we listen to the bull, join us in the attitude of prayer. Please share your prayers out loud or in your heart. Join me now in the words Jesus taught us to pray, the Lord's Prayer. Our Creator, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts. Hey, you guys are good. It's all good. You're in the right spot. Everything's good. Go, Charlie. Communion comes with a gluten-free option. If you need that, just tell the servers. All of the cups contain juice, not wine. And our reusable glass, which we sterilize after every service. These are ways that we make sure everyone is welcome at this table. We are responsible with our resources. Let us prepare ourselves in this hymn as those who are assisting with communion... Come forward. <laughs>
Bible is our symbol of our trust in God of abundance, who teaches us to look for hope in very small bites. Here at this table, we see a vision of God's kingdom, where there is a seat for everyone. You are all welcome at this table. You remember that Jesus gathered with his, with his community, broke the bread, shared it, and said, Take and eat. Eating this is like fellowship for the body. It is given for you. Then he took the cup, blessed it, and poured it. Take and drink. In this cup we see a new covenant of hope, of hope, trust, and peace, as if it were made in the essence of my life. In this small meal shared with all the souls in all the places and times, we get a taste of hope, justice, and peace that God has for us all. Let us share this holy meal together.
I blame you, Kelly. I blame you. <laughs> for, uh, for visitors, um, Test. the pastor here has a thing about the table being back in the right order, and uh, everybody knows it. <laughs> that was the part of the service that I was really looking forward to. <laughs> And you, you let Charlie just slide, you know, real good today. So, so Charlie, thank you. Thank you. All right. Church family, all of the news about the life of this church is available in our weekly newsletter, which you can sign up for at ucctulsa.org or in the North X. You can also give online at our website via the QR code on the back of your bulletin or by donation in the giving box at the back of the sanctuary anytime during the worship to support the work of this church, both inside and beyond our walls. I do want to make a special announcement uh, in honor of Pride Month uh, and thanks to a special uh, grant from the Gender and Sexuality Justice Ministries of the UCC, uh, we are giving $2,000 to the uh, Gender Umbrella Assistance Collective, a local organization offering direct support to people seeking mental health care, transportation, and grants to avoid eviction or medication cutoffs. Uh, we're also giving $2,000 to the Oklahoma Equality Law Center, providing pro bono name change and gender marker legal work right here uh, in Tulsa. And in addition to that, a new addition this morning that I just found out I've been, as, as I was walking up, uh, we have long been planning to be uh, the storage location for uh, an effort to have a pop-up a queer library uh, that will go all around Tulsa in pop-up sort of organizations. They needed a place to store all of those books. Well, they're stored right here, friends. They are stored... They are stored uh, in, our, in our education wing, and we will happily do that for as long as that goes on and be a part of that important effort um, I know the librarians among us are particularly happy about that. Yeah. So, friends, let us give thanks for these gifts, these many gifts uh, in prayer. Faithful God, let these gifts we bring today become seeds of your new creation, planted in the needs of the world you love, watered by tears and hope, weaving us together in love. Amen. Our closing hymn is exactly what you heard the kids sing earlier, so if uh, you can rise in body or spirit and join us in this closing hymn. The pressure's on. Go now in peace, pray for peace, wage a little peace, and love one another. Every single other. Amen.
Yeah, remember there's an ice cream social. Ice cream social in the fellowship hall. Ice cream in the fellowship hall.